Welcome everyone. My name is Coco Torres and I'm a volunteer and board member for the New York City Cornellians and the Cornell Tech Alumni Council. I'd like to start by thanking all of you for joining us tonight to learn about the Hudson River Estuary. Thank you to our speakers for accepting the invitation to come and share their impact on this iconic and biodiverse estuary area. And thank you to the volunteers in the Cornell Mid-Hudson Alumni Association and New York City Cornellians for co-hosting this program. Before we formally introduce our speakers and get started, I'd like to go over some program details. The presentation and the Q&A part of this event are being recorded. We will mute everyone's microphones during the presentation to avoid accidental interruptions. You'll be able to turn them back on for the small group conversation portion at the end of the program. The main program will be one hour, including two presentations from our speakers and including some time to answer questions from the audience. If you have any questions for our speakers, please enter them in the chat and we will get to as many of them as we can. After the program, join us from 8.30 to 9 p.m. to socialize with other Cornellians and continue the conversation in facilitated breakout rooms. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Laura Heady is the Conservation and Land Use Program Coordinator at the Hudson River Estuary Program at Cornell University. Judith S. Weiss, Arts and Sciences, 62, is a Professor Emerita of Biological Sciences at Rutgers University. She is a marine biologist with, that studies estuaries with a research specialty in salt marshes and is co-chair of the Science Technical Advisory Committee of the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program. Laura, Judith, it's a pleasure to have you here and the audience is yours, Judith. Okay. Um, ah, here we are. Okay, everybody hear me? We're gonna talk a bit about estuaries and then a lot more about salt marshes, but uh, they go together. I'm trying to change the slide here. Ah, okay, finally it decided to come. Okay, an estuary is a body of water where river flows into the ocean. So it has mixture of fresh water and salt water. Uh, so it varies in its salinity. And uh, this is a typical picture of, of an estuary, that, the mouth of a river really. Uh, this is a sort of profile view. Uh, you can see the water down here. And then we have an intertidal zone here. This is a zone where this is covered with water at high tide and exposed to the air at low tide. And here is a representation of a salt marsh in this intertidal zone. And then beyond that, we have the supertidal or above the, the tides, which is uh, the upland area. Hudson River is an estuary. It flows north during when tides are rising and it flows south when tides are falling. Uh, and this river has some salt water all the way up to Tarrytown and Nyack in the spring, and all the way up to Poughkeepsie Newburgh in the late summer or during droughts when there's less fresh water coming in. So we've got salt water quite far up the river, and, and it is uh, tidal all the way up to the dam in Troy, though what's going up and down way up there is just fresh water. At any given location along the river, the salinity goes up as the tides are rising and it goes down with ebbing tides. Uh, the Hudson is a type of estuary called a salt wedge estuary. These are estuaries where the fresh water coming out of the river is going quite fast. And there's very, relatively little mixing with the salt water that being heavier because of the salt stays beneath it. So you have this salt wedge moving up the river as tide is rising and moving down the river when the tides are falling and very little mixing in this type of estuary. Uh, the types of animals that live in an estuary 
At the top end will be basically freshwater organisms. At the bottom end are basically marine organisms. And in between, we have estuarine mm -hmm. organisms mm -hmm. which have to tolerate varying salinities. And because there are not as many animals that can tolerate varying salinities, they tend to be less diverse than either freshwater or saltwater biota. And now we're having trouble again, changing the slide. Okay, uh, there are some animals that go up and down in their life cycle. Uh, a life cycle that where animals are breeding up in the freshwater portion is called an anadromous life cycle and it's typified by salmon or more in our area in the Hudson and Chesapeake is a striped bass where the adults move up the river to spawn, lay their eggs, have the, off the embryos and the larvae up here in the nursery area and then they come back down to the ocean as they go big, grow bigger and mature into adults. So that's an anadromous lifestyle. The opposite situation, which is called the catadromous life cycle, is seen with eels, where we have the adults living mainly up in the rivers, and then they come down the rivers to breed and lay their eggs in the part of the Atlantic Ocean called the Sargasso Sea. And so these eggs develop here out in the ocean. They turn into this very strange looking larva called leptocephaly, leptocephalus larva, and they start migrating back to the North American shores and work their way up the rivers. So these are two sort of opposite life cycles. Now we get to salt marshes. Salt marshes are wetlands that surround an estuary. And we have an aerial view. You can see the marshes are here. These are winding tidal creeks that go through the marsh. Um, this view, you can see some plants are lower down right by the water. These are called the low marsh plants. These plants are flooded twice daily at high tide. And one species dominates here, smooth cordgrass or Spartina alterniflora has special adaptations to live in salt water. Here's sort of a profile with the waters here. Here's your low marsh with the cordgrass, Spartina. Here's the high marsh, a variety of different plants up here. The high marsh is not flooded regularly, but it can get flooded at especially high tides and during storms. So these plants also have to be able to tolerate salt and they're living in a uh, sediment that is, got, is salty. Uh, so how do plants deal with the salt? That's unusual for, for lots of grasses, certainly. And they also have to deal with soil underwater that has very low oxygen. Uh, the cord grass has special glands to secrete salt. See little white spots on these leaves. Uh, so that's the, the way it deals with the salt. It takes it in and then excretes it. It also has special tissues to transport oxygen down to the roots to deal with the very low oxygen. What do salt marshes do? Well, they are breeding grounds for a whole variety of fishes, shrimps, crabs, and birds, stopping off place for migratory birds, habitat for mammals. Marshes have very high productivity and they also function for flood control and storm surge reduction and filtration. Marshes are a buffer for coastal towns and cities for things like floods and hurricanes, uh, uh, coastal storms. They diminish the wind penetration and the wave strength. And a study was done about how helpful the marshes were in the New York, New Jersey area during Hurricane Sandy. And it saved almost one fourth of the costs of storm damage when there were significant amounts of marshes in front of community. Marshes also help to stabilize the shoreline, prevent erosion, and improve water quality. About the productivity, it's very high, comparable to a rainforest. There are very few grazing animals that eat the marshes while they are alive. But in the fall, leaves will die and fall onto the surface of the marsh and further decay. And as they decay, they become what we call detritus. 
Here's a picture of detritus, dead plant material, along with the microbes that are decaying it. And detritus in marshes and estuaries is eaten by a variety of small animals, such as worms and, cra and some crabs and some clams and little critters called isopods, which are then all eaten by larger animals such as fish, birds, and mammals. So detritus is a base of the food web, basically. Some other important marsh animals include the ribbed mussel shown here that puts out these, these threads which attach to sediment grains or roots of plants and help bind the sediments and retard erosion. Uh, there's a whole variety of different crabs. I include up here a horseshoe crab, which isn't really a crab, but since it's called a crab, I include it here. Got various kinds of hermit crabs, fiddler crabs, blue crabs, green crabs, marsh crabs. Uh, a whole bunch of fishes that use salt marshes, including the killifish, silver sides, sheep's head minnows, stickleback, flounders, and um, pipefish. And a whole variety of birds. I'm uh, not going to name them all. If you've been down to the shore, you're familiar with all these birds. It's the salt marshes are a great place for birders. Uh, now I'm looking at impacts, how humans have altered our salt marshes. Uh, back in the 30s, people thought they a way to get rid of mosquitoes might be to make these straight line channels. These are called mosquito ditches. You can see them up close here. This is what a natural tidal creek looks like. If you see straight lines, it's been dug. Uh, and it turns out that these were actually not very effective in controlling mosquitoes, but did reduce the populations of birds and fish. So that wasn't really a great idea. Main thing that people used to do with salt marshes is fill them in to build towns and residences and industry and just expand the land. They called that reclamation, bad word. Uh, this is what Manhattan looked like when Henry Hudson arrived. It was called Manhattan by the people who lived there. And you can see the shape here of what we now have, uh, how far out that is from the original shoreline. The shoreline now is all hardened pretty much all through Manhattan. So there's no marshes. Uh, there are marshes remaining in the other boroughs and much, uh, all our airports were built on former salt marshes, lots of Queens, lots of Brooklyn. The most severe problems that marshes are having now is a combination of sinking subsidence plus sea level rise that work together to, um, to destroy marshes really. Um, in Louisiana, the main problem is subsidence because the, the marshes aren't getting enough sediments to build themselves up. We also had similar problems in Jamaica Bay, which I will talk about a little bit later. But you see here, these red areas are areas, this is the profile of the marsh years ago, and this is its profile recently. So some of these marshes have shrunk a great deal and some have shrunk a lot, uh, not so much. Uh, the problem we're talking about is sea level rise due primarily to both a combination of expansion because of they're getting water, it gets warmer, it expands, plus the melting of glaciers, adding new water into the area. The rate of sea level rise is excel accelerating and is currently over five millimeters per year in our area. When the sea level rise is rising up faster than the marshes, you see things like large pools. Well, they start out as small pools where the, the water is supposed to come off the marsh at low tide and it doesn't. So you're leaving pools behind and that drowns the plants because the plants are adapted to being part-time underwater but not to being full-time underwater. So they leave patches of mud and those grace generally increase over time. So we have a situation where you start out with mostly marsh and some water that becomes mostly water with some marsh, which then becomes open water and no marsh. So that's, that's the fate of marshes unless we do something. Now, if there is open land like forests or fields or whatever behind the marsh and the sea level rises, 
the marsh can migrate up. So you have a reduced forest here, the marsh is migrating upland. And, and that's fine in an undeveloped area like Delaware Bay, for example, uh, can move up into the uh, forest. Uh, in developed areas, there's a problem called coastal squeeze, where you are caught between the water and a hard place. The hard place being a road, houses, development of one sort or another. As you see in these pictures, these marshes really have no place to go. Uh, so what can be done about this is protecting migration pathways where municipalities could uh, arrange with property owners uh, to have conservation easements or various things where they agree to sell their house to the town and then the house can be torn down to leave open space for the marsh. Uh, and in some cases, perhaps roads, paved surfaces could be elevated or removed. So this is all ideal and, and runs into um, various social issues and political issues and isn't easy, particularly if you're dealing with some environmental justice communities and all sorts of other social issues. So it's not easy. Another thing that can be done is changing the way we manage Phragmites. Phragmites or the common reed is this plant here. Generally, it's an invasive species and people don't like it. Uh, and it's generally removed in restoration projects. Uh, but it supports a lot of life. It doesn't support quite as much life as the native Spartina marsh does, but it's, it's okay. As an academic, I would give it a C or a C plus compared to a, a Spartina marsh uh, in terms of fish. In terms of invertebrates, in the mud and on the surface, they are both equivalent. But for the purposes we're talking about, the most important thing is that Phragmites enables marshes to elevate faster and have a better chance of keeping up with sea level rise. Uh, and there was a, there's a community up the Hudson called Piermont. And Piermont Marsh, there's a neighborhood that is convinced that the Phragmites in front of their neighborhood protected them from more damage from sand, from hurricane sand. Uh, Phragmites also sequesters more nitrogen, sequesters more carbon dioxide. And since carbon dioxide is the major cause of climate change, uh, the more carbon that the marsh can hold, it, hold on to, that's not going in the atmosphere, helps to reduce the amount of climate change we're getting. So leave some in place, don't take it all away. And of course, leaving some in place won't cost anything. Taking it away is what costs money. Other sort of engineering approaches to marshes that are in danger of drowning is using, uh, is increasing the elevation by spraying new sediment on top of the marsh surface. And this is called thin layer deposition. Uh, it buries existing grasses. Some will naturally reseed the area others may have to be planted. And it's clearly not pretty for a few years, but it's probably worth it if you can rescue your marsh. But you will have to do it over and over again uh, over the years. How thick you make it will be a critical issue. The thicker it is, the longer you can wait till you have to do it again. An example in our area was uh, Jamaica Bay. I showed you this picture before. These marshes had shrunk to uh, shadows of their former selves. And uh, the Army Corps of Engineers had a, uh, a harbor deepening project which provided lots of sand for them. And they used that sand to uh, put more sand on, the, on these islands to enlarge them again. And the volunteers came to plant uh, new marsh grasses. So the goal was to restore marsh islands to the 1974 size, which is obviously not as big as they once were. The considerable amount of sea level rise had happened already. And of course, as time goes on, these marshes are gonna be shrinking again as sea level continues to rise. Another thing that can be done with marshes that are in danger of getting law of being destroyed through sea level rise, you have, this is a, a typical thing you can see at the edge of a marsh 
uh, where it gets undercut. You have this um, erosion going on here. And of course, when that goes on underneath, the, 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 the grass here, this whole chunk of grass and mud is gonna fall over into the water. So you have a receding edge and shown in profile here where you've got the undercutting and the grass is here, you know, gonna sort of fall off taking chunks of the sediment with them. So this approach is putting something harder right here at the eroding area. And uh, often this can be oysters, it could be mussels, it could be rocks, it could be something, but it's preventing the erosion, it's protecting this marsh edge. And they call this a living shoreline. And it's certainly it's a very effective in uh, reducing or eliminating the erosion at the edge of a marsh. Uh, there is a living shoreline and a salt marsh in Manhattan, which I never knew till a couple years ago, on the Harlem River, a place called Sherman Creek, Sherman's Creek Park. And uh, you can get there on the subway and there's a real life salt marsh there. And the uh, New York Restoration Project is making a living, has, has put these out. These are retarding the, the waves to prevent erosion in the marsh behind them. And if this has just gone in this fall, so it's just beginning. And uh, they're very hopeful that this uh, is going to enable the marsh behind it to thrive. Uh, ending on a happier note, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the Hackensack Meadowlands in New Jersey, which you can see this little pink dot in this map of the state of New Jersey. Uh, here is the Hackensack River running through. These are very, this is the Hudson River here. So this is very close to the Hudson. We have um, various different creeks indicated here and lots of developments. I mean, the towns around the Meadowlands are low-lying, frequently flood, because they were built on former marshes. Uh, the Meadowlands is the largest open space area in the metropolitan area. It, for decades or perhaps centuries, was the place for garbage dumps, for raw sewage, extensively filled in, full of development that was polluting the river, uh, industries, chemical industries, pharmaceutical industries, all sorts of industries, just discharging all kinds of stuff was a very smelly, disgusting place for years. And then in 1970, Congress passed the Clean Water Act, which meant they built sewage treatment plants. So that took away one major thing. A lot of the chemical industries moved away from the area, and so there was a considerably less pollution starting from the 1970s. And then uh, they formed also around the same time the Hackensack Meadowlands Development Commission, whose initial mandate was to regulate and close the garbage dumps. But later on, they developed a mandate to emphasize conservation and environmental protection rather than development. They took the word development out of their name. And the Meadowlands has undergone in the past, I guess, 50 years now, an enormously wonderful transformation. It no longer smells. It's got a lot of wildlife. You can see a collection of egrets, I guess, here. Here's Empire State Building in the background. It's a beautiful place. You could go on eco tours there. Uh, the Hackensack River Keeper uh, and, and the uh, Meadowlands Commission offer eco tours. You can rent kayaks, canoes, and so forth. And for recreation and wildlife, it's a wonderful place. It's this far away from New York City. So for those of you who live in New York, I highly recommend you take yourself over the Hackensack River uh, Meadowlands in New Jersey. Uh, one final little point, we did a recent study of how New Jersey marshes are doing with regard to sea level rise. And it was only the Phragmites marshes in the Meadowlands that are elevating faster than the rate of sea level rise. And I'm done. I turn it over to Laura to talk about what's going on higher up in the Hudson River. <clears throat> Uh, 
Great. Thank you, Judith. Let's see here. Here we go. <clears throat> well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Heady, and I am the Conservation and Land Use Program Coordinator at the Hudson River Estuary Program through a partnership with Cornell University, um, Department of Natural Resources, and the Environment. Oh, try to get these slides to cooperate. There we go. So uh, this evening, I'm really looking forward to talking to you um, about the Hudson River Estuary Program and giving you an introduction to the work of the program, as well as specifically the work that our team does um, in the estuary watershed. And so for the presentation this evening, I'll give you an overview of the Hudson River Estuary Program. We'll do a little uh, virtual exploration of some of the features of the estuary watershed. Uh, I'll then introduce you to the team that I uh, coordinate, our conservation and land use team. And then uh, I'll close with a few ideas if you'd like to learn more or get involved, because I know we don't have enough time to cover everything uh, this evening. <clears throat> so, oh, tricky slides, there we go. Um, so the Hudson River Estuary Program works throughout the, uh, both the estuary, that tidal portion of the river that Judith described, as well as the watershed. And so just to give you a sense, the map on the left on the slide shows you the watershed that includes all the way up to the headwaters um, in the Adirondack Mountains. Um, and that, that stretch of the river that extends north of Troy, that's actually non-tidal. The estuary portion of that watershed is the area marked in uh, green in the map on the right. And <clears throat> see here. And the reason we work throughout the entire estuary is because water really connects all of that land in the watershed. That whole area that drains down into the tidal portion of the river um, is, is delineated here in this oblique view of an air photo. And all of those blue lines represent the tributary streams that flow ultimately down into the estuary, eventually out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but you can imagine all of that land is really connected to the estuary um, through these streams. And so that's why we take an ecosystem-based approach um, and why the estuary program focuses on the whole watershed and not just the estuary. So uh, to give you a little bit more background on the program, so the estuary program started in 1987 through the Hudson River Estuary Management Act, which said, it is hereby declared to be the policy of the state to preserve, protect, and where possible, restore and enhance the natural resources, the species, the habitat, and the commercial and recreational values of the Hudson River estuary. Um, and then in 2001, the program expanded to focus on that whole watershed, not just the proper estuary stretch of the Hudson River. Um, the program is funded uh, annually through the Environmental Protection Fund, or the EPF, of the New York State budget. And the work of the estuary program is outlined every five years in our action agenda, which is essentially a blueprint for our work. It has both short and long-term uh, targets with strategies um, and very measurable metrics to reach those uh, short and long-term targets. And collectively, the work that we do is organized around six key benefits, a vital estuary ecosystem, clean water, resilient communities that are able to adapt to climate change, fish, wildlife, and habitats, uh, the beautiful iconic natural scenery, like this view from Constitution Marsh down in Cold Spring, um, and then also to be able to provide education, access to the river, uh, recreational opportunities, and of course, uh, inspiration, which has been an important part of this river for a very long time. There we go. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more, um, stay tuned. We have two publications soon to be released. Um, first is our next action agenda, which will update our work um, out to 2025 and, and organizing again our work around those six benefits but with consideration of emerging threats and um, new issues, um, as well as a new set of measurable metrics to demonstrate progress. 
that will be available for public comment in the next few months uh, or the next couple of months at this point. We'll also be releasing our next uh, State of the Hudson report, which comes out every five years. And um, this, this current uh, State of the Hudson will provide a snapshot of environmental conditions for the estuary. Um, but both documents really reflect the work we do um, with partners, because really the estuary program relies on the work we do with many partners. We're unique within the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, so we're a program within the DEC, um, but we're not a regulatory program. We really collaborate with many different partners in pursuing conservation and environmental restoration activities. And those partners include everybody from federal and state agencies to universities like Cornell, um, nonprofits, land trusts, schools, uh, county and local governments. Um, and this photo is a great example. It shows the over 300 people um, that represent partners and stakeholders who gathered in Poughkeepsie at the kickoff of our last um, action agenda, which we just completed um, the work on last month. So what does uh, Cornell have to do with all of this? So um, Cornell is one of our key partners. We have um, contracts with Cornell's Department of Natural Resources and the Environment and the Cornell Water Resources Institute. And so the Natural Resources um, and the Environment Department uh, provides staff for uh, the conservation and land use team that I manage, as well as our Hudson River Fisheries Unit. And then the Cornell Water Resources Institute um, provides staff for our watershed team, climate team, and education team. And you know, we all are situated um, at the DEC Region 3 office in New Paltz, but we have close partnerships and relationships with staff and faculty on campus uh, in Ithaca as well. So I'm going to talk in detail about the conservation and land use team that I coordinate, but briefly just want to share the work of my colleagues on the other teams. So the Hudson River Fisheries Unit actually monitors our signature fisheries in the estuary. So they're out on the river um, during the field season, um, monitoring sturgeon, uh, striped bass, uh, and herring. The watershed team is focused on all of those tributaries that you saw um, in that oblique view of the watershed. They're focused on improving stream habitats and water quality through everything from stream side tree and shrub plantings to inventorying and replacing culverts and dam removals, um, as well as collecting uh, water monitoring data. Our climate team uh, works with shoreline communities in particular to plan for sea level rise along the Hudson River, as well as other climate uh, impacts and risks. And then our education team uh, develops curricula about the estuary, actually trains teachers and educators on how to provide instruction about the Hudson, and also engages students in river-based projects uh, like our annual Day in the Life of the Hudson River. And so all of us are really working, again, to help implement that action agenda and to help uh, the program ultimately achieve those six key benefits. Okay, now next, um, let's take a little exploration of some features of the estuary watershed and why it's so special. So here again is that map of the watershed shown in blue. Um, we have Albany to the north, New York City to the south, and there I am in the mid-Hudson, um, kind of sandwiched between the Rondout and the Wallkill Rivers, which are two of our major tributaries. And I'm about eight miles away from the tidal tributary mouth that you can see um, on the left, that's the Black Creek um, flowing out into the Hudson. And so the estuary is tidal, um, as Judith pointed out, all the way up to the dam in Troy, which is near Albany. And that's about 150 miles of tidal tributary or tidal river or estuary. <clears throat> and that area that surrounds the estuary is about 5,000 square miles. So the watershed is quite large. And what is challenging, and this is a different map showing the watershed with the boundaries of all the different municipalities in our watershed. So we have uh, about 10, or we have 10 counties that are bordering um, the estuary. And then we also have New York City. Um, along that corridor of those 10 counties, there are 261 individual municipalities. And if you're not familiar with New York State home rule, each of those 261 uh, cities, towns, and villages have their own elected officials, their own planning and zoning boards, and they're all making decisions about land and water that can permanently you know, impact our incredible ecological resources. 
Not to mention um, in that watershed, uh, at least 80% of the land area is privately owned. And so why is that a concern? Well, the estuary watershed is one of the most biodiverse parts of New York State. I mean, if you're familiar with the Hudson Valley, we have everything from mountains and ridges to river valleys and lowlands, all of which are providing really sets of diverse ecological characteristics that therefore support very diverse different communities of plants and animals, but also provide economic uh, benefits like scenic beauty and recreational opportunities as well as all the ecosystem benefits that Judith talked about, things like water quality, climate adaptation, flood control, um, and so forth. Um, but in particular, in regards to biodiversity, back in 2006, um, the DEC uh, and Cornell worked together to produce um, this report, the Wildlife and Habitat Conservation Framework for the Estuary Watershed, and it identified 23 significant biodiversity areas. And these are areas with good examples, high quality examples of ecological communities, significant landscape features and habitats for rare or important uh, plants and animals. And I'll point out a few, everything from like the Rensselaer Plateau up in um, Rensselaer County, uh, major features like the Catskill Mountains, the Hudson Highlands, but then also some maybe more obscure lowland areas like the incredible wetland complexes we have in uh, Dutchess County um, and Ulster County up into Greene County and even down in New York City. So each of these areas are described in that framework. Um, and uh, I also want to point out, as Judith did so well, that um, the estuary um, along the shorelines, I'm really focused on the watershed, but along the shorelines, we have these tidal wetlands, but what's really unique is that we have freshwater tidal wetlands because those tides are, are, are felt all the way up you know, into Greene County and Albany County, Rensselaer County, and wetlands that are in the Hudson in those freshwater tidal areas are really of global significance because it's such an unusual set of characteristics. Within the estuary corridor, we have incredible biodiversity um, in terms of vertebrate uh, diversity. In a study that we um, funded with Cornell about 20 years ago, it documented that of all of the amphibians that occur across the state of New York, 85% of them are in, those, um, in that area along the estuary. 73% uh, of the reptiles, 87% of the breeding birds that occur across the state of New York are right here in the Hudson Valley, and similarly high numbers of mammal species. So we really have a tremendous natural heritage that we want to protect for future generations. Um, and so, that was kind of the impetus behind starting the team that I'm on, the Conservation of Land Use team, which was um, kind of the brainchild of um, uh, my former supervisor, Dr. Ted Kerpes from the DEC's Bureau of Wildlife, and Dr. Milo Richmond, who was the former um, director of the New York State Cooperative Fish and Wildlife um, Research Unit at Cornell. And so they started our team, which was called the biodiversity team, now the conservation and land use team. And really, you know, we were addressing this question, how do we grow our communities while still ensuring that the rich heritage of our watershed is conserved and it remains resilient to environmental and climate change? And so what can we do to address this conservation need? Can we purchase all priority lands and waters? Well, show me the money. There's not enough money to buy all the important lands and waters. Can we stop climate change? Sadly, it's too late. We're already feeling the results of climate change. We're already seeing its impacts on ecosystems. Can we depend on state and federal regulations? Sadly, I mean, many forests, wetlands, and streams are unprotected. And I guess what's even more unfortunate is that many local decision makers don't know that. And so that's part of uh, uh, what we are doing is trying to make sure people understand what is and isn't protected so that they can fill the gaps in what's, uh, what's protected or not. So finally, can we improve our land use planning? Well, bingo, that's actually what we have something, something we can do about. And so that's been the target of our work. And um, our conservation and land use team works directly with decision makers like planning and zoning board members, open space commissions, comprehensive planning committees, and anybody involved in local municipal planning, county uh, planning, as well as land trusts um, to encourage uh, planning based on natural resources. So how do we do that? Well, a couple of things. Um, we really want to encourage the um, uh, application of conservation principles in local planning. 
um, things like protecting large contiguous natural habitat areas. So many municipalities really focus just on the um, jurisdictional boundary of their town or their city or their village, but that's not how natural systems work. So trying to convey the importance of thinking about natural systems as they occur across the landscape, preserving links between habitats that will enable shifts from climate change or enable wildlife to move across the landscape, um, encouraging communities to maintain broad buffer zones of natural vegetation to protect the important interior habitats, directing development um, away from sensitive areas and instead directing development toward altered landscapes. You know, we talk about breaking ground for a new development project. We want to move development away um, from fresh ground and instead maybe shift it toward areas that are already broken. So those are some of the principles we are encouraging. We're also encouraging the use of um, good current science-based data sets. And the approach that we've always used since the beginning, um, it's always kind of remained the same, that communities first need to identify what they have um, in terms of, you know, through maps and inventory, use that information then along with uh, community input to set priorities, and then finally develop a strategy or plan to protect and manage those priority resources. And this approach can be applied to whether you're designing a new site plan, or if you're trying to look at a town or county or even watershed wide plan. Um, and our approach to achieving this has been to work with partners like Cornell, like the New York Natural Heritage Program, to develop science-based data. So we're constantly learning more about the watershed and what our conservation priorities are, um, making sure that data are available through online mappers and different publications that we're developing. But we also need to raise awareness so that community leaders care and understand why this is important and that it's of value to their communities both ecologically and economically, and even from a human health perspective. We then provide grants and technical assistance to incorporate these science-based priorities into plans and policies at the local level. And then we also try to scale up and share these kinds of approaches to inform regional and state initiatives on conservation and resilience. And we did document um, uh, how, what our approach is and, and the, the impacts we've had in a survey we did with Cornell social scientists back in 2013, which are summarized in uh, two briefs, but I just wanted to share this great um, anecdotal quote that we got from one participant of the survey, which on average took people over 20 minutes. We had over 200 people respond, so it's a great body of data, um, but one respondent said, uh, our newly designated conservation board, and this is at the municipal level, has become much more widely utilized by our planning board as a planning partner on site plans that have or might have any significant conservation conditions. Part of the reason is that some of my colleagues and I have taken the time to att attend trainings and the gained expertise is now considered an asset by the town. So we're really trying to build the capacity of decision-making locally to really help us uh, implement the vision of the entire estuary watershed conservation. So just to wrap up, um, I wanted to give you some ideas. If you'd like to learn more or get involved, I would encourage you to visit our websites. <clears throat> our team has a new website that we just launched last year on Cornell's website. It's called Conservation Planning in the Hudson River Estuary Watershed. And then of course, there's the Hudson River Estuary Program web pages on the DEC site. You also can sign up for a number of different email lists. We have the Hudson River Almanac, which for those of you interested in natural history, it compiles individual uh, natural history observations submitted by anybody from New York City up even past Albany, whether people are seeing new migratory birds arriving in the spring, uh, fish that they may have caught and so forth. It really gives you a great sense of um, what um, is happening throughout the watershed or throughout the river. Uh, we also have um, the estuary programs email list called RiverNet, which gives news and updates on everything from policy to funding opportunities to stories about some of the work that are happening, um, some of the work that's happening at the program. And then another smaller project that I run is the Amphibian Migrations and Road Crossings Project. Uh, there's a volunteer photo at the bottom right there with a the spotted salamander. Uh, you can sign up to get news about the annual migration of amphibians from the forest to vernal pools for breeding. That happens usually in March uh, and April. You also can attend a webinar to learn more about conservation of land use. We had one just today that I think about almost 200 people attended and um, the recordings are available online and we hold new webinars each month. 
And then finally, you can explore some of the volunteer opportunities with our program. Um, they're all on uh, also again on the DEC site that I've listed there, but they include everything from the migration project to our American eel research, um, the trees for tributaries program, which involves streamside tree and shrub plantings, as well as the cooperative angler program, which um, engages fishing uh, men and women with documenting and submitting some data on their catch. So um, lots of opportunities. I know um, they're being shared in the chat, but I think we'll make these uh, presentations available as well. And you're certainly welcome to contact me if you um, wanna follow up and have any questions. But I think we're gonna be available now um, to answer questions. Um, if I can stop the slide view here, let's see, I'm gonna give up my remote control here. There we go. And then Esta can lead us in some Q and A. Well, first, thank you so much, Judith and Laura. This was fabulous. Um, I really enjoyed it so much. Both of you were terrific. I really learned so much. My name is Esther Bigler, and I am a volunteer with New York City Corn Cornellians, and I'm also on the executive committee of the ILR Alumni Association. And I would like to ask all our wonderful participants, if you have a question, please pose it in the chat, and I will do my best to get to as many of the questions as I possibly can. And we already have some in the chat, so let me start. The first question, and I think it's probably directed to both of you since there's no name attached. How dangerous is it to water quality when sewage treatment plants are flooded and the water flows into the Hudson? It is uh, clearly putting raw sewage in the water is very bad news. Fortunately, the Hudson River flows very rapidly, as I said at the beginning, so that if it's coming, if, you know, major storms and the river is running brown because of overflow from sewage plants, uh, it's going to be a few days, but it won't last very long because the river flows out and it will go out into the ocean. So it's, it's temporary, but uh, it's not good for the critters that are living there for sure. Um, no, and I'll just add, I mean, I first should give the caveat, again, I work in the watershed, so I'm not a Hudson River expert, but I can say that the colleagues I have on the climate team are trying to help communities assess their risks that they have from sea level rise um, to try to understand what the impacts are going to be to infrastructure on the shoreline from storm surge and sea level rise. So they can start to plan for improving some of those um, some of that infrastructure on the shoreline that might be vulnerable that could cause um, things like sewage treatment uh, to be, or sewage to be flowing into the Hudson, as well as, you know, other types of pollutants that would be um, potentially released if uh, buildings were being flooded and infrastructure was being flooded. Thank yeah, you. I'll just say there's a great example of that work, if anybody's interested. Um, Josh Sarah from the Landscape Architecture Program at Cornell has been working um, with my colleague Libby Zemitis on the Climate Adaptive Design Studio, and that engages landscape architecture students with uh, urban communities on the Hudson River shoreline in helping them kind of vision a different shoreline that's more adaptable to sea level rise and that's less vulnerable to situations uh, like flooded wastewater treatment plants. We have another question. With the growing movement to remove dams, is there any talk of removing the Troy Dam? If so, what would be the positive and negative impacts and what are the primary benefits of the dam? Well, I feel uh, inadequate in that I don't know much about the Troy Dam. I can tell you, I've never heard anybody talk about taking it down. Um, what I can offer is that um, there are a lot of old dams that don't necessarily have a lot of purpose on those tributaries flowing into the Hudson River. And in many cases, um, herring, American eel, uh, you know, so herring species like alewife and uh, blueback herring, they actually swim up those tidal tributaries, but they can only swim as far as the first dam. And so what um, the watershed team in our program is doing along with partners like Riverkeeper, 
are trying to look into whether or not it's feasible to remove some of those dams in the tributaries that will then enable the tidal flows of the Hudson to go even further upstream and therefore um, expand upon the available streams uh, habitat accessible to species that are coming up the Hudson River and spawning. Actually, that photo I showed earlier of the Black Creek tidal tributary mouth, that's a great example of a creek that in the spring, it's great, you can go and you can actually see herring swimming um, up, the, um, uh, up, the, uh, up the Black Creek tributary there from the Hudson River. And it's really remarkable. And so, yeah, so the, the attempts at removing dams are really in those tributary streams where they might be even unsafe, they might be decrepit, they might not be serving any new purpose. So it's really about building relationships with landowners and the agencies and the nonprofits who are all kind of teaming up to um, find where it might make sense to remove dams. Another question, or really somebody is asking you to discuss. Um, could you discuss, one of you, the recent ban on oil barges in the um, Hudson River estuary? Well, I don't know that much about it. I'd say certainly possibility of oil spills is not something we would like. I, I don't know if that oil if it's not going in barges, it's just going to be going some other way, getting transported some other way uh, in trucks or something else that, um, you know. <laughs> I, I would suggest if you're interested in that issue, um, look at the Riverkeeper website. They did a lot of work on, uh, and Scenic Hudson as well. Those are more of the advocacy organizations in the Hudson River, which we are not. Um, uh, but they helped to kind of, I think, do some research and some outreach on why those barges were being proposed and whether or not there were better locations for them. I mean, the idea is that there have to be emergency kind of docking locations for barges moving up the river in case there's inclement weather or, or something else. Um, but there were certain reasons why locations proposed weren't right. And from my understanding, the response of people in the Hudson Valley writing letters about that was one of the largest <laughs> examples of community input for something related to a Hudson River issue. Um, so yeah, so certainly the advocacy organizations like Riverkeeper and Scenic Hudson would have more information on that. That's what? right. Yeah, hey Ned, <laughs> um, great. I'm glad you're adding that in there about the um, Anchorage locations. <clears throat> Why isn't the tidal area of the Hudson good for raising oysters like they do in the estuary in Maine? There are lots of projects. There is a uh, organization in New York City called the Billion Oyster Project. And they have their headquarters uh, in a um, marine oriented high school on Staten Island. And they have the kids all involved and they raise oysters and they take the little oysters and are planting them in, in uh, bags, net bags, all over the place. The problem is in many parts of the city, the water quality is still not good enough for them to thrive. Uh, it's, it's ironic because if you had more oysters, the water quality would get better because oysters can filter a lot of water in an hour and then you can you know have an aquarium with a lot of muddy water put oysters in it in an hour your water is clean uh, but you know it's a matter of how long it's going to take before the oysters are, will really thrive and get self-sustaining and apparently the situation is not good enough yet but in the old days around 1900 before, well, I guess before, about 1900, they started going to pot. But before 1900, oysters were all over New York Harbor. I mean, they were all over the place. And it, within a, you know, maybe two decades, in the early part of the 20th century, they were all gone from industry, sewage, you know, all the stuff that no, you know, getting dumped in there. So um, they're working on it. Okay, let's see. We've got some such wonderful questions here. I want to make sure that we cover all the questions that people have asked. How many communities take their drinking water from the Hudson 
And is there an emergency New York City intake south of Poughkeepsie? I don't know. I don't know if Laura, do you know how many communities? I know some do, but I have no idea how many. Right, I believe it's, um, it's about it's about seven to ten municipalities that drink water from the Hudson, and they've actually recently kind of um, convened as a team to address drinking water issues together, which is really smart. We're always trying to encourage intermunicipal collaboration on um, uh, resource protection, so that's really a great um, outcome. Okay, and now a question about Manhattan. Um, so this is someone who says, I would like to highlight Pier 26 here in downtown Manhattan, built to represent Manhattan's former shoreline. Are there any cleanup initiatives for the Manhattan shoreline? This person lives a block from the river and was very interested in it because he believes or she believes there'd be broad support. And lastly, what else could we do here in Manhattan? I think there are lots of groups that um, do, uh, before COVID, BC was a different world than we, we live in right now. But BC, there were a lot of groups, uh, school groups and, and, and just, you know, clubs and, what, and, and various groups that did cleanups along the shoreline. Um, this is pretty much suspended, although I know individual people do still, do some beach cleanups. Part of the shoreline in Manhattan is not very easily accessed though. Uh, there are still regions that, you know, it's kind of hard to get down to the water uh, easily. Um, that was half of the question. What was the other half of the question? The other half of the question is, um, let me pull it back up because I was looking at for other questions. Give yeah. me a second. Um, what else could we do here in Manhattan? What else could we do? We can kayak. There are kayak places. There are groups of people who go swimming. You're not really supposed to, but there are groups of people who do swim. You can go paddling. I've seen people on stand-up paddle boards. Um, you know, you can do lots of, uh, you know, recreation on the river. There are places where you can rent kayaks, canoes and so forth. It's a little risky. You've got big boats going up there. Right. You know, you gotta be careful. It's not the same as uh, paddling, you know, in, in some rural area. There are big ships coming up the river. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little risky, but people are doing that. Well, again, I want to thank you, Laura and Judith, for really wonderful presentations. I want to thank our participants for some great questions. And I'm sorry, everyone, that we weren't able to get to all of your questions. But there's some wonderful information that is in the chat. And I hope many of you, of course, will stay for the breakout sessions. Now it's my pleasure to turn this over to Janelle. Um, Janelle, could you join us, please? Hi, thank you, Esta. A huge thank you to Judith and Laura for sharing your remarkable conservation efforts in the Hudson River estuary and for answering the questions from our attendees tonight. Um, it's always a pleasure to learn about what Cornellians and Cornell are doing for our communities. The Hudson River in all her majesty is the cornerstone of life for those of us living close to her waters. We're glad to know about these efforts to maintain the biodiversity of uh, the biodiversity the Hudson supports. And I also want to thank all of you who joined us tonight. Um, it's been great seeing you here and I hope that you enjoyed the program as much as I have. Don't go anywhere yet. Um, we're now going to move into the breakout rooms and the font has gotten much smaller on what I'm looking at. <laughs> if you are not participating in a breakout uh, room activity, please feel free to leave the call now. The group discussions are not being recorded. If you are staying with us, please allow us a minute while we wait for those who are not staying to drop off. You'll be able to turn on your mic shortly, and we also encourage you to turn your video on when you're joining the breakout room. 
Soon you will see a message popping up asking you to join your designated breakout room. A volunteer will join each room to get the conversation started. Again, we wanna thank you all for coming and joining us this evening. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it and have fun in the breakout rooms.